The information provided on LifeInterruptedRadio.com is for educational purposes only. Welcome, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And as always, it's just my honor and absolute pleasure to be with you here tonight on another brand new episode. And I am just having so much fun. That's, uh, we're getting close to five years. At the end of the year, it's going to be five years we've been doing this, too. And through this healing journey of mine and through the journey of creating the Autoimmune Hour, I have met the most amazing people. And one cool thing is as you get sort of what I'll say, this exponential ball rolling downhill type of thing, it begins to gather steam, which is just awesome. And part of that gathering steam are the amazing people that you meet. It just becomes bigger and bigger, like, oh, you need to meet so-and-so and you need to meet so-and-so. And my guest, you, I'm going to tell you about her, and then you'll probably recognize her name, or because, her, at least her last name, because her sister has been on the show too. And it's one of those things where I met both of these absolutely charming women, and I said, you both have to be on the show. So if you're saying, hmm, I remember that name, well, this is her sister, actually. So let me get started and introduce you to Carolyn Aylward. She is the creator of Get a Helmet. I love that name. We'll talk about that too. <laughs> a company focused on heart-centered storytelling through video and audio. She creates brand documentaries for females identifying small business owners, artists, makers, and also offers one-on-one mentorship, mentorship sessions for women ready to unapologetically reconnect with their power, release shame surrounding their body image, and relieve anxiety. Get a Helmet is also a podcast. I love it. It's, it's a, such an interesting podcast. What I love about podcasts is they can be done so many different ways. And Caroline and I, our podcasts are very different, but also very much the same. I just, I was listening to some of them. So you'll have to check out Get a Helmet podcast. Anyway, I'm digressing here because her podcast is focused on spirit, spirituality, creativity, and wellness. And it's available on iTunes, Spotify, and anywhere you can download your podcast. At the end of this year, Caroline's shooting a film on women's body image and self-worth right there in where she's from, Boston, and with all female identifying crew and cast, and that is so awesome. Welcome to the show, Caroline. Having me. I'm very happy to be here. Oh my gosh, I'm so thrilled to have you here. We had Hannah on not too long ago, and it turned out awesome, <laughs> and I know I had the chance to meet both of you, and you know, you both have such powerful missions. Now, tell me, what got you interested in this idea of re- releasing shame around our body image and then oftentimes, unfortunately, the resulting anxiety? What got me interested in it, I would say, is my life experience, is you know, existing in this world as we do, taking in media in all forms, whether it's you know, on your phone, on TV, in a movie theater, and, and seeing mainly one type of body, one skin color really being represented. And as a young girl, you know, we take in so much of this and we feel it's a very fragile time of our lives being super duper young. And I struggled with my own body image at a very young age and wanted to be smaller and was constantly trying to manage my weight uh, from a very young, a young age, even when, you know, you go from having one body frame, then you go through puberty and your body completely changes. And I have had an interesting journey with uh, my weight just kind of yo-yoing up and down throughout life and those that correlating greatly with how, how my anxiety levels are as well because that's a, another part of my journey too has been my mental health and, and struggle with anxiety and depression and things like that. And so moving this idea of moving this through your system physically actually getting into your body and letting all of these kind of negative thought patterns and things like this go by opening up the body, opening up the heart and breathing deeply into the nervous system. And so, yeah, I I feel like so many women primarily that I've spoken with have an interesting relationship with their physical body and have at some point in their life felt like they wanted it to be different, to be smaller usually. And I thought, well, a beautiful conversation to have, you know, why don't we create some space for each other here to talk about this and to understand that what we look like has absolutely nothing to do with our 
with how much we're worth, with our worth and with our, how much we have to offer the world. Oh my gosh, that's beautiful. And so many questions came up for me there. <laughs> the first place I want to go though, is this idea of, you were talking about going into ourselves and being centered and breathing through it and breathing it out. Can you describe that a little bit more? Is, is that a meditation or something different? Well, you know, there's a, a many different ways to categorize it. I think that I've, I'm a huge meditation fan. I believe meditation has saved my life on many occasions and just kind of being with myself, being quiet with myself, giving myself that time. And of course, there's so many different forms of meditation and there's no right way to do it. It's, um, there's so many different ways. There's guided meditations, there's TM, there's just sitting and breathing, there's breath work, there's all of these different ways to do it. And I have found the breath to be powerful for so many reasons. And I think that when I say move things through the body and breathe through them, you know, there's, there's a reason why we have phrases in our culture like, oh, what a sigh of relief. Because that's an actual real thing. You know, when we breathe deeply enough and take the time to be present with our body, breathe into our lower belly and exhale loudly, we're pacifying our nervous system. We're activating the parasympathetic ner nervous system. So on a scientific level, on a biological level, that's a real thing. Um, and also anyone, any human being knows that when you stop to take a moment to breathe, you know, take a breath take a breath. Everything's gonna be okay. Just take a breath. It's actually real. You know, it's, it's a real, a real thing. And I think the, the more that you get into your physical body and start to move it, whether it's through dance or yoga or playing a sport, you know, the breath is invigorated. The breath starts to fire up even more. And I think it's just such a magical tool that we all have, you know, right here in our bodies to offer us some freedom. And some often overlooked because it's so common. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of those simple tools, one of those helmets, as I like to call them. Yeah, we'll get into your helmets in just a minute, but I wanted to cover some breath for some more, for a little bit more, because I think too often, as I was just alluding to there, we take breathing for granted and don't realize that we get in these habits of breathing. I know you do a lot of documentary work and video work. I imagine that one of the things you have to be very mindful of is how is everyone else breathing too? Totally. I think when we get nervous, you know, when we get into that fight, fight or flight response, when we feel stressed, the breath is really short. It's really tight. It's really high up in the chest. And even our body language starts to shift. We feel like even right now I can close my body off and I don't feel as powerful. If you start to sit up, the spine is lengthened. There's more space in the diaphragm. You feel more at ease you know, there's more space to breathe into the body. And, and one of the things that I love to do with my work is do these meditation, these breath sessions with people prior to shooting with them. Um, number one, to have a really important conversation about what we're shooting and what the story is and to connect on this level and to open up. It really, really provides an opportunity to get grounded, to take up some space with the breath, to maybe make some noise on the exhale, and only benefit, you know, clearing the mind, get clearing the cobwebs, you know, feeling less brain fog. Absolutely. I know people, brain fog's common with autoimmune. And while it's much more complicated with autoimmune, I found just being very aware of my breathing does help it a little bit. It can begin to clear it over time. But the thing that happens for me is I'll be busy working or I'll be type, you know, writing something on the, one of my books or whatever. And I'll notice that I've forgotten to really, how am I breathing? And I'm stuck in some sort of holding my breath as I'm typing the next sentence or something. And Absolutely. That's, that's when I notice the brain tends to just to begin to dissipate or disappear. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I find that all the time. And with teaching different movement classes and yoga classes, I often, you know, when we get into a little bit of a hard or like a more difficult pose, the breath stops, breath stops in the room. And so I'm like, are we, are you breathing? It's such a simple question. But when these things start to feel a little bit more tense, a little bit more difficult or more vigorous on the body, we kind of tighten up a little bit. And so just to remember that even in those moments that feel difficult and scary, that the breath can still be there and that you can breathe yourself through it. 
Absolutely. I I was down in uh, California the other day t- doing a teaching a seminar. And one of the things that we were doing was for my body language work. And I had people pair up and had one, well, both of them start breathing high and rapid. So almost put themselves into fight or flight just by that high and rapid breathing, even though they knew there was no danger. The yeah. mind, the, the mind didn't know it. And then one of them pre pre uh, determined one of them began to breathe slower and slower and slower. And every one of the pairs noticed that the other person could not maintain that high and rapid breathing because they began, their body began to match the person who was breathing slower and slower. So I, I just throw that out there for you listening because sometimes we can go, I don't know why I'm breathing high and rapid. It's just, It's just, you know, I don't know what's happening. Well, maybe it's not just you. Maybe it's the environment. Maybe someone else in the room is breathing high and rapid. And it's up to you to slow down and change everyone else. I think that's... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, even in a yoga class and and teaching, watching people go through this, you know, by the person next to you on your mat, breathing really deeply, it's inspiring you to slow your breath down and to take deeper breaths. And it, it... totally, totally happens like that. Yeah. And I think it's one of the healing things that we never hear about in the Western medicine about how are you breathing? They might ask things like, how are you eating? How are you sleeping? But they never remind us to come on. It'll be okay. Because it is scary. It is scary to get a diagnosis, you know, it really is. And sometimes we find ourselves holding our breath chronically during these scary times. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. And so anything else that you'd like to share that you learned on your journey of recovery from uh, this idea of uh, having a body image that you weren't happy with? Oh, boy. You know, the journey of recovery, I feel like for me primarily, my struggles were with anxiety and panic attacks and having that, those moments, speaking of breath, of hyperventilation and, and things like that. And so really focusing on slowing the breath down was important for me, was a huge lifesaver for me. Um, And then the body image stuff is so interesting because I, growing up, I felt it. And it's not until recently in my life since I've been working on this film project and, and doing more work with women in groups and individually to understand how they're feeling and and try to get to the root of that. There's so many layers of this body image stuff. And I think we're living in this really amazing time now where more and more people that we are seeing in the media are, are all different bodies are being represented, all different skin colors and types of bodies are being represented. And it's just beautiful. I mean, it's a simple, it's the simple concept of exposure therapy, being exposed to things like this, you know, someone like my size walking into a target and seeing a mannequin that's my size, you know, that's not necessarily just that one size, you know? So I think it's a really powerful time that we live in. And in terms of my journey of recovery for body image, I think that it's, um, it's the journey, not the destination, you know, not to be totally cheesy, but it, it absolutely is. And every day it's just consciously making myself aware. If I have a thought that's like, oh man, I really wish that this looked different or, oh my goodness, I wish that this was like this to just be like, okay, well, there's that thought. And that it, I don't need to let that thought be in the driver's seat. It can be in, it can be in the car with me and it can come along for the ride and be a part of my journey, but it's not going to drive, you know, and just to be able to notice that this is where our minds are trained to go because it's what we've thought and allowed ourselves to think for so long. So to just kind of catch it, to catch it in that moment and to be like, you know what, rather than letting this infiltrate my system, why don't I shine some like immense compassion into my heart right now? That's beautiful. Oh my gosh. Shine immense compassion. It's a little bit early for a break, but I'm going to take one there because I want you all just to spend a couple of minutes during this commercial break. (sighs) Breathing deeply, go ahead and sigh out loud. Don't worry. People aren't going to stare. And just uh, shine some compassion in your heart. I just love that, Caroline. We'll be right back. One of the things that we've been talking about is her own personal journey through her self-image, body image, and ang- the resulting anxiety and different stressors that happen when we are exposed to this. I ought to say, you know, we can make it they seem like our thoughts, but my gosh, you just turn on any social media or any 
I don't television, whatever, and you're just inundated with it. So I'm sort of think that we're indoctrinated into it as well. So Carolyn, you had us do um, sort of breathe into it. And I hope everybody enjoyed that commercial break as they really checked in with their breathing. I wanted to talk to you about Get a Helmet. First off, I love the name, and you and I connected over that because one of the things my teenage son used to say when it was particularly stressful and someone would be sort of whining or what, whatever, he'd say, buy a helmet, adapt, and, or get a helmet, adapt, and overcome. <laughs> and I was just, when I saw the well, name. That's so funny. Your, <laughs> when I saw the, your name of your company, I was like, oh, my gosh, another get a helmet person. <laughs> but where did you come up with get a helmet? I grew up hearing that uh, from my dad. I grew up hearing, you know, life's tough, get a helmet. If there was anything ever happening to me that I was maybe complaining about or whining about, you know, he always liked to keep things in perspective for us and being like, okay, let's check in here. This isn't a huge deal. If it's something really big, we'll deal with it. And so it was like, life's tough, get a helmet. And then throughout my childhood and into my adult life, uh, it just kind of evolved into get a helmet, get a helmet. You know, I'm we're kind of a funny, goofy family and we like tend to abbreviate things down and make a ton of inside jokes. So get a helmet became this joke. And I just thought that it had this kind of funny, goofy ring to it because things talking about things like this, like anxiety, depression, mental health, body image, and can be really serious sometimes. And I think it's really important to bring a lightheartedness to this space, to the wellness space, to the, the health space. And it's also just so who I am and part of my personality. And I believe that, you know, having that spiritual side and having that kind of funny side and can, they can totally coexist. And, um, so yeah, get a helmet just became this, I, this ability to kick off conversation about what is, what is your helmet? What are these things that you turn to when life gets inevitably tough as it does? What is, what is it that makes you feel like you're armoring up for your toughest moments and you're ready to go? And, you know, we all have so many helmets and they might change um, every day, every hour. But I think opening discussion about them is, is beautiful and gives people other ideas as to how they can build up this, their toolkit and, you know, live a, a brighter life. Absolutely. And as you said, everybody has their helmets. I was thinking of numerous ones that I uh, switch in and out all the time, depending on what I'm doing. If I'm giving a speech, it's a completely different helmet than if I'm coaching someone. It's fascinating to me. What are some of the helmets that you've heard people use that you're like, wow, hadn't thought of that one? Well, I was just interviewing someone today and she actually had an entire list that she's kept in her phone since 2014 of self-care tips, but uh, essentially helmets. And one of them was cold showers, <laughs> cold showers, which um, has a ton of uh, different benefits for your lymphatic system and for your nervous system and all of these different things. I've had someone say Bloody Marys, which I completely understand. I've had, you know, mine has changed. I slow mornings, like having a really slow morning is a really big one for me. Uh, my yoga mat. Um, and then other people have said, going for a long walk. That's a really, a really big one that I've heard and, and calling a loved one and just letting the tears flow and clearing the system and being able to do that. They, it's all over the map. It's all over the map. And I encourage people to just let their helmets be theirs. You know, it doesn't need to be like my green juice or, you know, my vigorous workout routine. It can be whatever it is. It could be petting your dog, cuddling your dog, you know? Yeah, mine for when I'm speaking to a really large group because uh, may or may not know that I'm really an introvert. I like to a lot my alone time. I like my thinking time, and uh, you know, I'm so passionate about what I do. It's not hard for me to get up and speak in front of a group. However, I have a friend who's a huge extrovert, and I just watch my friend just be so comfortable in front of large groups and my helmet is what would they do in this situation <laughs> mm, I love that and I step into some of their behaviors and it's funny how my body just instantly adapts it's going okay these are the behaviors for right now There's yeah that's kind of that fake it till you make it energy <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's great 
Yeah, it's absolutely that that type of thing. Although I have to say, I'm not a fan of fake it till you make it because sometimes the unconscious, my unconscious brain will say, ah, Sharon, we're just faking it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I like to use the phrase um, as if. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do mm -hmm. this as if I'm so-and-so today or I'm going to do this as if I'm courageous today or I'm going to do this now as if I'm whatever and put myself as if I'm whatever noun or person place or thing I want to put into that spot and, and that works pretty well because gosh my unconscious brain can argue with me at times where I'm just like yeah I'll be quiet back there oh absolutely it's amazing how just thinking that putting yourself into that headspace will shift your mindset it's incredible it's a lot faster than people think. I just want to mm -hmm. throw that out there. Breathing is a really fast tip that Caroline shared with us and this, and this uh, helmet idea of what, do, how can we switch in and out of these different helmets is also another quick and easy, simple, uh, free, <laughs> absolutely free way to uh, play with these ideas, play with all these uh, topics and things. Now, I want to make sure we have enough time you work a lot with people about heart-centered storytelling and what have you found as the power of when someone is able to tell their story Ooh, i love that question so much the power of storytelling is immense and by someone sharing their experience and their authentic self it then creates space for others to do the same which maybe prior to hearing another person's story, they didn't feel like they could, or they didn't feel like it was good enough, or they felt like it was too weird to share, honestly. And by, by having these heart-centered conversations, by telling heart-centered stories, and really just embracing the human condition, embracing the messiness of this human life and the gorgeousness of it, it allows people to all just kind of breathe that sigh of relief of like, I, my story is worth it too. I am worth it too. And I have something to share with the world that could inspire someone else because it's this domino effect, you know, by, by seeing or reading or hearing someone else's story or a story, even if it's a character, even if it's a, a narrative made up character, some thread of that will resonate with you and inspire you inspire you to go do something you have yet to do or to be exactly who you are, which is my passion. Like I have chills all over my body talking about it. It's absolutely, it's changed my life. I remember growing up and this is when I fell in love with film and with storytelling and just watching different movies and different things and just being like, what an, what an interesting character. And I see so much of myself in that character. And I guess that's okay for me to be me then, you know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think the power of authentic storytelling, and by that I mean that, as you were calling it, heart-centered uh, storytelling, is so powerful for people to understand I'm not alone. And yes. I think that's part of the power of the autoimmune hour is we have great people like yourself and Hannah, your sister, on who tell their stories and realize, oh, you know, I'm not alone. Someone else feels that way or feels similar to, to some thoughts that have gone through my head and allows us to realize that there is a community that is willing and able to understand what you're going through. I think too often, especially with a diagnosis, that we can just feel like nobody else gets how what's going on in our mind. And, uh, and the other part is too often the medical community overlooks that, the mind part of it the different mm -hmm. stories we tell ourselves or medical professionals tell us about the diagnosis. Goodness sakes, when I got my diagnosis, it's a huge long word, could have been supercalifragilistic for all I heard, because the minute they started to say it, from their body language alone, I could hardly hear what they were saying. I was just their body language, the head down, the sort of not wanting to make eye contact, all these things were like, okay, this isn't good. <laughs> it was amazing to me how my ears closed up and and where I didn't hear a lot of it. So I'm, I'm thinking about the stories that people tell us that um, are not helpful versus the ones where people tell us and we can relate. Absolutely. And, you know, what you said of you're not alone, you know, letting the storytelling be a method of understanding that you're not alone, that has played a huge part in my life. And 
with dealing with anxiety and, and panic attacks and going through these generalized anxiety um, kind of spirals, I, you feel like there's this overhanging heaviness around you and you feel like there's, you're never going to get out of it, that there, it's just impossible that no one could ever understand what you're feeling. And when I started sharing my story about that and my personal journey with my mental health, so many people have come to me and said, this is exactly my situation. And I mean, just being able to relate with another person on that level, whether it's me sharing my story or someone else sharing their story is it's medicine. I mean, that, that in itself will decrease your stress levels and therefore the inflammation in your body. You know, it's, it has this domino effect of, of, um, you know, on a biological level, but I, it's, it's just so powerful. It's so, it's so, so powerful. And that loneliness, whether it's with a diagnosis or, you know, dealing with some sort of mental health issue or anything, you know, any loneliness, loneliness is a heavy, heavy thing to feel and we all feel it. Right. So why not communicate that? Why not talk about that and talk about how to move through it and know that it's okay to feel lonely, that it's part of the human experience, you know, and, and not almost shame ourselves for feeling that. Like it doesn't make you any less than to feel lonely. (laughs) Like it's a part of being a human. And that goes for feeling anything like that, feeling sad, feeling angry, feeling anything like that, that, that you just merely need to let move through your body back to what we were initially talking about is resisting those kinds of emotions and trying to push them away. They will only fester underneath the surface. So letting them be felt, you know, and, tapping into yourself, getting to know yourself a little bit better and and understanding how can you allow yourself to feel these things? Does this mean that you need to go for a walk or be alone or call someone or, you know, turn on a song and dance around your room like no one is watching because that feels amazing. (laughs) (laughs) I have my go-to songs. (laughs) I love that. We all do. You know, it's it's funny, you, you know, driving in your car and you look over and everyone's singing in their car and dancing in their car. And I think that's so awesome, you know, and it's like people want to move their bodies. We want to, we hear music and we want to move our bodies. And now I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but it's, um, it's powerful to know that these different, this wide range of emotions that we feel as human beings, we all feel no one is immune to them. Yeah, that's true. And that it's okay. I think that's a big thing. Sometimes in the medical professional uh, professions, I have felt shame when I had said something and was labeled very bluntly, well, you have anxiety. Mm. Just boom, like a brick, you know, right, right into my lap. And I had to point out, and this is just years of, of building courage to be able to speak back out, speak out, and when that, like, no. I have situational anxiety. You're telling me you want me to take this medication. I just read all the side effects and the bottom line is death. You know what? That made me anxious. (laughs) Makes a lot of sense to me. (laughs) I'm telling myself that's normal to have a little anxiety when you read one of those labels, right? (laughs) That have the four point type that go on and on and on. Oh, yeah. Uh, And that's where I think that it's really important that we have other people that get us that have been through something similar and the power of storytelling is so important. And to know that your story is awesome regardless of whatever the story is. I mean, it's, it's, and we all have multiple stories too. I think sometimes people go, what's the value? I, I, you know, I haven't had a very exciting life. I just, you know, went to school and graduated and went to work. I beg to differ. I know that there's some juiciness in that story, whoever story that is. <laughs> and that's what I love to help people unearth. You know, I love to get to the root of those stories. Everybody has something to share. There's a reason why people have been sitting around fires sharing stories and why building community has just been one of the most important things of all time for us to maintain healthy life, lives and healthy minds. So when you're, uh, you know, mining for the gold in somebody's stories, what are a couple of questions that you might ask someone so they could really begin to root around in there and find the gold nuggets? Mm, That's such a good question. I really love to ask them, what's the last thing that made them laugh really hard or what makes them 
smile. Uh, and if they start to laugh about something, dig a little deeper. Like, what are you laughing about here? Um, something else that I've been experimenting with lately is, can you show me three photographs from your life? Pick any three that feel really important to you and let's talk about why they're the most important. You know, it's this person maybe for a living owns a juice company, but you know, this photograph could be of their grandfather's lobster traps or something. And like this being a really huge part of their life, this being like, maybe it was their grandfather's work ethic that inspired them to do what they did. And to let that be that really unique piece of their story shine through, even when maybe we're making a video about their juice company, you know, letting these unique parts of everyone's story have their time to shine and come through. And that's the beauty of conversation. I think that conversation is, you know, one of life's greatest adventures. And just by having a really open conversation, you, that naturally happens that unearthing those little gold nuggets that you're talking about that happens just in conversation and you just got to dig a little deeper and make sure everybody feels comfortable, hold some space for each other. And, um, yeah, it usually just happens naturally. We all, we all have so much to share. Absolutely. And I was reading a study recently that had me rather sad. It was saying that people, uh, and it wasn't just pointing fingers at millennials or Gen X or what Gen Z or any of that. It was just said people in general, they did a big survey, have lost the art of conversation. Mm. And that's, that if asked about it, small talk makes them uneasy. And I was like, Ow, how sad. Because I've had some amazing conversations waiting for my coffee. So <laughs> totally. I it is sad and it does make sense because I think so much communication today is over text message or over Instagram or over Facebook message and email. And we're just constantly communicating that way. And you know, I understand not being a fan of small talk, but sometimes the intention behind a person's small talk is to actually get to know you. So I think rather than being approached by like, hi, how are you? And how's the, the weather today? Super nice. Like maybe just think, I'm just going to, I'm just going to let this in right now because what, why I'm not going to, this doesn't need to harm me. You know, this, this can be fine. And I also understand like getting stuck in an elevator with a group of people and they're going up to the 23rd floor and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be in this quiet room with them for, you know, at least 15 seconds. Like, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> but, you know, I think break the silence, say hello and, and let that quote unquote small talk in a little bit because people are, people have shut down a lot more. Like I, I live in Boston and so riding public transportation and being on the train, sometimes I, I look around and everyone's head is down looking at their phone. Everyone is like either looking at their phone or they have their headphones in. And I'm totally guilty of this as well. But sometimes I think, what if I just started talking to this person next to me? Like, how crazy would that be? <laughs> that might make a good video. I'm just thinking all of the, the different responses from uh, acceptance to like, you must be nuts. Are you talking to me? I mean, I could think this wide range of interesting responses you'd get just by saying hello. One totally. of the I like to play just walking down the street on a nice day is uh, making eye contact a little longer than quote unquote normal mm. with someone as they're walking down the street and see if they say hello to you. It's interesting. If, if I'm getting too close, I'll say hello first, but <laughs> I play this little game in my head like, okay, how, you know, are they going to look away right away the minute I make eye contact with them other than just enough contact not to bump into them, you know, but actually extend the eye contact. I totally, I totally understand that. And it's funny. Some people will just look away and pretend like you're not even there. And other people will say hello from like way across the street. You know, it's, you never know what you're going to get. Yeah. It's a fun game to play. Mm -hmm. And we're going to contemplate that game and what other games we play when we take our final quick commercial break. We'll be right back in a couple of minutes. So we've been going to all these amazing different places. I want to talk about your film a little bit because this has me fascinated too. What an amazing project that you're putting together. Tell us a little bit about what actually took you from your work around working with body image and women and brand documentaries saying, you know what, there needs to be a film about women and self-worth. Oh my gosh. Well, it's such an important topic and I feel, you know, that everyone can benefit from it and men as well, you know, and just body image being 
such a big thing that we, you know, we look at our bodies every day, we see our bodies every day, and we have these kind of tumultuous relationships with them most of the time, which is so, so sad. And I, you know, grew up as a dancer. I'm, I still dance and it's such a big passion for me. And uh, luckily in the past few years, I've found that dance has been an incredible way for me to build my confidence and to open myself up to just moving my body and not having as much attention on what it looks like, but more so what it feels like and letting it feel good and not being like, it has to be perfect. It has to look like this. I have to fit into this perfect little box and wear this outfit. Like, ugh, that is just all, it's so exhausting. And I think that again, right now we're living in this very powerful time where this work has been going on and is going on right now to empower women, to help them feel strong and good in their bodies, to understand that there's not one right way to look or be, um, not, then there's not one right life to live as a woman. And, you know, I, I live in, living in Boston, there's such an incredible creative community here. And starting Get a Helmet, launching the company, one thing kind of led to another where I'm connecting with so many different women. And I started to just envision this story going on in my head of, of hearing these interviews with, with real people and talking to them about their relationship with their bodies and seeing women of all different shapes and sizes, colors, ages, and getting them into their bodies, having them move a little bit to music and understanding how liberating that is and how moving through that fear is, is busting through so much and just empowering you. And so I started to, I honestly started having dreams about this vision and I started talking to more and more people about it. And one thing led to another. And now we're shooting it. It's called In This Body. We're shooting the first weekend in December. And I have built such an incredible team already of all, an all-female crew and cast. I mean, we're focusing primarily on women and I would love eventually to open that conversation up to men. I'm starting with women because I'm a woman and that's what I know best. <laughs> but eventually... You know, I would love to do a longer piece that just focused on humans and bodies in general. And so, yeah, we're working. I have a choreographer that I'm working with and a producer and a composer, and we're putting together all of these pieces that are going to build this beautiful puzzle. And everyone in the community has been really helpful so far with donating space and equipment and their time. And I'm putting together a fundraising campaign so that we can raise just enough money to help feed people the day of the shoot and get them to set and pay for some fil uh, film festival submissions and to get this message out there. Because I think that when I was a little girl, I would have loved to see something like this. I think it would have really helped me rather than hearing certain things that I heard when I was younger, like, uh, you should have this color hair, you should be smaller, you should work on this part of your body, blah, 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 blah. I really wish that I'd seen something like this um, to make me feel like I was good enough exactly as I was. So that is my biggest dream to have every single person that watches this feel that, feel empowered and feel reconnected to their power and that they are absolutely enough exactly as they are. So it's been this incredible culmination of things. And now this film has taken on a life of its own. And I am just trying to connect with more and more people out there, more organizations, businesses, artists, anyone who wants to be a part of this story and to contribute to the making of it. Because everyone here in this, in this town and in this community is really um, excited about it. And I can't, I can't wait to share it. We're going to have a, we're going to have a screening on International Women's Day next year um, here in Boston. So it's going to be it's going to be awesome. Oh, and congratulations. How exciting. You can just hear your passion in your voice. And it just gives me goosebumps because that's the same passion that's keep, kept me driving for almost five years on the autoimmune hour. And let's talk about what happens when we find that passion, that mission that happens for us. I know for me, people say, wow, it seems like a lot of work. And when I stop and think about it, I, I guess... You know, it's not even a, a, a solid yes. It's just like, well, okay, maybe. But I'm just so passionate about the show and bringing the information out. It's funny. It doesn't seem like work anymore. That's so beautiful. I, I, com I completely understand that. And I, I'm, I'm pretty new to this game, pretty new to 
not working for someone else. And I, you know, for the past six months to a year, I've been really focusing on building this company on my own. And uh, it's a different ball game. It's definitely a different ball game. And, and that's also not to say that just because you're passionate about something, that means that it needs to be your career. I think that there's a lot to be said for not suffocating your passion and your creativity uh, with the pressure of financially supporting yourself. Um, and I also think that being able to connect to your passion is, it doesn't have to be this complicated thing. You know, I think taking some time and getting quiet with yourself and writing down like what lights you up? What makes you feel joy? And just writing that down, whether it's dark chocolate and avocados or it's telling stories or it's having an amazing podcast, you know, by writing those things down and starting to connect with yourself a little bit more, things will start to, the puzzle pieces will start to come together. And I mean, I have by no means got it figured out, but I feel that I've just followed my, this deep, deep feeling in my heart and in my gut that uh, connecting with other people and by telling stories, I mean, that's all that I, that's the thing that makes me the happiest in the world, whether it's through video or audio or my body. And so um, I feel really grateful because I know there are people out there who don't necessarily feel as connected to their passion or kind of like, I don't even know what I'm passionate about. And so it's, I feel really grateful for it. Absolutely. And I think it's just notice those little things that light you up. And even if they aren't so smack you in the face obvious, you know, just listen to them when they're there and let them be what they are, you know? <laughs> I like that, let them be what they are. So many times, especially as young people, that we're told like, oh, you know, stop playing with that or, you know, that's never going to earn you money or whatever it is, regardless of whether any of that's true or not, it doesn't matter. But so often, and sim similar with our body image, we're getting these outside messages about body image and also what, what really our gifts are, what, what we're passionate about, what we love to do that doesn't even feel like work. Totally. Absolutely. And, and what are people coming to you for? What do people often come to you for, for whether it's advice or your opinion? There's usually some magic in there, too. Yeah, that's a great one. That's a great one. What do people, if even your friends, like, so, well, what are people coming to you for? Maybe they're, you're going, well, Carolyn, Sharon, I'm not a coach. I'm not a consultant. People don't come to me. They're not knocking on my door like, a, like I'm an accountant or something. <laughs> but, you know, our friends will ask, what do your friends seek advice or counsel from you from is another one, another way to go, oh, well, I must be pretty good at doing X, Y, Z. They're always asking me for my, my cupcakes, even. Yeah. So, <laughs> being able to do anything like that. I love that question. What do, what do people come to you for? Because that's another way to know. And I should say, what do people come to you for that, that really juices you up, that gets you yeah. going. That, align that alignment is great. That kind of zone of <laughs> yeah. genius is great. You know, what are people coming to you for? That shows you there's a need for it. There's a desire for it. And then in addition to that, what lights you up? And those two things aligning is that's it right there. Yeah. And watch for the pattern. Now, oftentimes uh, I like to use some journaling to make sure that I'm catching the pattern. That's important for me. Sometimes I dismiss things oftentimes, getting busy, and I'll just say, oh, I'll think about that later, or I just dismiss, like, oh, no big deal, whatever. And I don't really see the patterns. Oftentimes, uh, I, even just chatting with friends, I'll go, oh, wow, Sharon, great idea. And I'll just dismiss it, like, oh, no worries, no big deal. And I want to throw out this idea of stop dismissing ourselves. I mean, I think journaling is such a powerful tool in writing, writing those things down because it's so easy to forget them. and. I am teaching a masterclass right now. It's called Movement, Meditation, and Magic. And we're, we're dancing, we're doing yoga, we're meditating, doing some breath work together. It's this five-week course that I'm teaching. And we're journaling a lot in there. And I've, I'm encouraging everyone as we're going through all of these practices to pick up your journal whenever you feel called to and write something down. If you're like, ooh, that was interesting, or oh, that resonated, write it down. Because then you can go back and reflect on what those little moments were that would totally have easily slipped your mind and uh, start to build your own practices based on that and start to understand yourself a bit more, You know, connect with yourself on a deeper level. Well, it's, and you know, one thing that, as you brought that up, that so many times I'm either driving or uh, in the shower is a great one where am amazing thoughts come to me and I think I'm going to remember it. Mm -hmm. I keep repeating it over and over as I'm, you know, washing the shampoo out of my hair or something. I just need to learn to go step out, write it down because I promise myself I'm going to remember it and doggone, by the time I get done, 
I'm like, that was a great thought. Now, what was it? No, totally. <laughs> I do that all the time as well. You need a whiteboard in your shower. <laughs> exactly. Maybe go to scuba shop, get us one of those whiteboards, that, <laughs> yeah. the underwater wa boards, whatever. Well, we're just down to the last five minutes, Carolyn. What else would you like to share with the audience that we haven't had a chance to cover? Hmm. We've, we've touched on so much goodness. We've touched on the power of breath and movement. Um, I guess, you know, my specific journey I felt like I was pretty inundated with, um, with my struggles with anxiety, you know, for most of my life. And so the body image stuff for me is something that I'm only recently, like relatively recently tapping into that, um, is, is unearthing so much other parts of my story for myself. And I think that I was pretty, if anyone out there struggles with anxiety, depression, you know, knowing that it's something that you, you can and will move through and that seeking out community is a huge part of that and understanding, like we said before, that you are not alone in those moments and that there are so many different things that you can do for yourself, so many different helmets that you can turn to to move through that space. Because when you're underneath that dark cloud and, and feeling like you're never going to move through it, you can't really focus on anything else. Like, I think I was so anxious at that point in my life that I couldn't even really connect to the fact that I had some some really deeply rooted body image stuff going on. It wasn't until I moved through the anxiety stuff that the body image stuff was able to kind of surface. And, you know, we are all just doing the best with what we've got. And, you know, there's such a fine line in this, this finding this balance between pushing yourself, working hard, trying to become this better version of yourself, and also just understanding that you are enough and that, you know, being in the present moment is the most powerful thing. So it's this balance between these two, right? And, and it's a balance that I'm, I'm consistently trying to strike. And if I ever find a magic potion for it, I will let you know. Yeah, I like that. Sure. <laughs> it's so true. I like to say, I just want to make sure that I optimize one thing a day. It doesn't have to be big. It's just like maybe remembering to wake up and, and be, have my grateful, my grateful moment. What, what am I grateful for, for waking up and have starting this new day. It doesn't have to be big, guys. It can be, you know, these optimizing one thing every day instead of pushing myself to check absolutely everything off my to-do list. Absolutely. I have a little sign by my bed that says drop into gratitude because I think it's really important to do that as many times a day as you possibly can because something as simple as the sun is shining in the sky or the wind is blowing through the trees or, you know, my room is clean. That brings me a lot of joy. <laughs> so <laughs> I, any, any of these little things to just let your nervous system feel what it feels like to feel that gratitude, that, that love. And it kind of takes the negativity and the anxiety or whatever it is off course. You kind of like break the circuit there and, and have, have the body feel into something much better than those negative thoughts. Mm, true. Absolutely true. So everyone, that's Carolyn Aylward. Tell us your website so everybody can know and how we can uh, support your movie as well. Beautiful. Yeah. So I'm on Instagram at getahelmet underscore. And my website is getahelmet.co. There will be tons of information on the website and on my Instagram about the film and about everything else that I offer, my one-on-one -on -one mentorship and uh, brand documentaries as well. And uh, my podcast, that's another great way to stay connected with me. It's the Get a Helmet podcast and I'm on iTunes and anywhere else that you stream your shows. You just have to look on iTunes or the other streaming services. Just get a helmet and she will pop right up there. Said, have a great week. Whatever your adventures, join me next week for another brand new episode. Enjoy. The information provided on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune and Life Interrupted Radio, including the websites understandingautoimmune.com and lifeinterruptedradio.com, plus social media, is for educational purposes only. What you read, hear, and see on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune and Life Interrupted Radio, and its websites, and other media outlets is based on experience only. The information should never be used for any legal, diagnostic, or treatment purposes. Always seek sound legal, medical, and or professional advice regarding any problems, conditions, and any of the recommendations you see, hear, or read here on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio.